good morning and welcome back to NPTEL online certification course on Indian poetry in English. All of you are listening to lectures by Vinod Mishra and uh, I think you all remember that in the previous lecture we talked about Eunice D'Souza, a celebrated Indian English poet who actually brought in her poetic world the element of modernity through the element of rebelliousness which many people would call but then she actually vouched for a sort of change she yearned for a sort of change and though change is especially in the lives of women now today we are going to take up another important voice though not much attention has been uh, paid to this voice but once you go through her poetic numbers you will realize that this voice also should have been given due space and due importance my dear friends the world of indian poetry in english is actually full of poets and there are many poets who because of some regions or the others could not attract the attention of anthology editors and many of them may call it is only because of the sort of indifference to women but then as time flows more and more voices of women they are appearing on the scene of Indian poetry in English and one such voice is none other than Lakshmi Kannan. Now in the previous lecture we talked about how Eunice D'Souza since she was not comfortable with the different rigors, restrictions, impediments and many more bindings she actually created a sort of or caused a sort of stir in the minds of women through her poetry. But here is another Indian English woman poet who also has the same amount of rebellion but her rebellion is of a different sort, not aggressive but subtle, not interrogating but at the same time addressing the women and in, in her approach to address those women who were suffering what Kannan does is she goes back and remembers many such women poets, many such women voices who actually came forward to represent but then their sacrifices and their efforts have till now not brought or bred any fruits. So before we go into the poetic over of Lakshmi Kannan, let us have a look at uh, the background. Lakshmi Kannan also belongs to the post independence era of Indian writing in English and she was not only a poet but she also wrote some essays, stories, novels. And, and, and to uh, say in one word fiction as well, women as we already have discussed they were struggling with a forced identity, imposed identity by the patriarchal framework. We have had uh, this experience in many of the previous lectures. Uh, this framework most often ignored uh, their uh, potential, I mean the potential of uh, women, uh, their individuality, their talent, their sparks and even their language. The influence of modernity had become uh, visible on these women writers too and the, they, they registered their voices how not only by expressing them through poetic numbers but also by registering them uh, through different genres fine be it poetry, be it novel, be it short stories and their identity and the search for their identity became very important. Actually uh, Lakshmi Kannan uh, was a bilingual, 
uh, she, she writes both in English as well as uh, in uh, Tamil. Uh, we will come to see how uh, she uh, tries to bifurcate when she writes poetry and whenever she writes prose or whenever she writes stories. Tamil society of 1960s and 70s have become the background of majority of the writings of Lakshmi Kannan. As uh, is the practice that before we come uh, to examine or before we come to understand uh, the poetic, you know, a world of a poet, we try to understand the biography. And in this regard, Lakshmi Kannan, a bilingual writer, poet, translator, novelist and a short story writer was actually born in Mysore in the year 1947 when India, you know, uh, the, the date uh, is very important because and the year is also very important. So, she, she, she was born on 13th of August 1947, 1947 and we all remember uh, that only two days before she, she actually took birth in independent India and then uh, she started feeling uh, the experiences and having the joys of being a poet in the post independent world. Actually, traditionally uh, she was named Kaveri which is uh, uh, on the basis of a river. Uh, most of uh, the Indian women in ancient days uh, were named on the basis of rivers, on, on uh, the basis of uh, the deities and all fine. Uh, Lakshmi Kannan is uh, not only a poet, but uh, she was actually a professor at IIT Delhi uh, fine. Uh, by her nature, she is uh, quite reticent and uh, perhaps she did not like much of the visibility, but she continued uh, her sojourn of uh, writing. She was actually a member of the jury for Commonwealth Writers Prize uh, Eurasia. She also received Manjula Srinivas Award for Best Women Writer in the year 2012. Uh, one thing is very important to notice about uh, Lakshmi Kannan is that her, uh, her, her works have been translated into French, German, Spanish, Arabic, Hindi and many other Indian languages. Now, what are her poetry, po poetry collections? The very first collection of Lakshmi Kannan is entitled Impressions. Look at the name, Impressions. So, maybe these are the impressions of the poet herself and the impressions of the world in which she left. Then came the glow and the gray. It came out in 1976. In 1985 uh, came Exiled Gods. Exiled Gods. Lakshmi Kannan did not write, uh, you know, uh, very frequently, but unless and until things stirred, because in many of the interviews she has uh, herself said that unless things came uh, to a person naturally, uh, the writing cannot be justified. And then came in 1985, Exiled Gods. Then came Unquiet Waters. Look at the title of the poem, Unquiet Waters. So, Unquiet Waters can water uh, and, and you know when she uh, says water, when she titles it water, uh, the water here is a metaphor, water here is a symbol. And uh, like all other women poets, uh, Lakshmi Kannan also writes about women's issues, uh, but she writes in a very silent, subtle manner and then she tries to uh, convey her message and in a way she wages a war, but it is a sort of silent war. So, this Unquiet Waters was edited by uh, Keki and Darubala. We have already uh, uh, discussed and uh, have also had a lesson on Keki and Darubala. And Keki and Darubala was uh, quite helpful to many uh, poets. Both Keki and Darubala and Arvind K. Mehrotra, uh, these two people actually uh, helped many of uh, these poets who were in the making. Now, uh, Kannan was not uh, confined only to poetry, rather she also became very famous because of her short stories which were uh, translated in several languages. So, in 1986 came um, Rhythm then came Parijat and other stories. One can find in the world of uh, Kannan uh, a blend of several religions as well. We shall see when we come to the lines. Uh, India Gate and other stories that came in 1993. Nandabana and other stories in 2011. Then Genesis which is select stories 2014. 
and then uh, Lakshmi Kannan also tried her hand at novel writing uh, that is in 1998 going home, going home. Now what could be the themes of Lakshmi Kannan's poetry? As we have been saying that majority of these women poets, they were actually struggling or they were trying to carve a nest uh, by creating a world of their own in search of their own identity. And uh, in search of their own identity, feminine self always became uh, the hallmark. Uh, but then uh, she is uh, more of a traditional poet where we can also find uh, poems which are devotional in nature, uh, namely Ek Danta Visharjana, fine. It is a poem which is actually addressed to uh, Lord Ganesha. Uh, then uh, we can also find a relationship and mosaic of romance in uh, Kannan's world. Ordinary women, they actually become a part of a Kannan's world. It is quite uh, unlike, uh, uh, you know, D'Souza where she talks about and she uh, takes a dig at the religiosity, uh, but uh, we do not find like this. In terms of religion, she is actually very submissive, I mean Lakshmi Kannan. And then uh, she also uh, depicts both sorts of suffering, both the internal and the external suffering. There is always a struggle between the external and the internal voice. And one thing which actually deserves uh, to be mentioned is uh, that we can find not only a sort of sensuousness in the world of Lakshmi Kannan, but we can also find a sort of a spiritual yearning. She also has her eye for uh, Dalit women and uh, uh, like, like women, she also talks about certain things, certain myths, namely of waters, of rivers, other Indian ritual and culture, we can find her world abundant with all these things. It is, it can be said that water and woman have been fused into one in the world of Lakshmi Kannan, fine. Lakshmi Kannan also talks about the multi-layered existence of woman and as I said earlier that uh, there is no denying the fact that Kannan's world is a blend of spirituality underlying Hinduism, Christianity and Buddhism. Uh, it is actually very uh, sad to know that Lakshmi Kannan has not been included in many of the anthologies, but I am quite hopeful uh, that with uh, the advance of time and all, Lakshmi Kannan's poetry because of its sensuousness and spiritual yearning will become a part of the major anthologies which are in the making. Now, uh, it, is, it is quite uh, natural for a poet uh, to express her own idea of her creative impulse. And since Kannan uh, was a blend of so many genres in her poetry, short stories, novel uh, and then essays here and there. In one of the interviews which she gave to uh, Ranabir Rangra in one of the books where 50 years of celebration of women writers and poets. In one of the interviews when Ranabir Rangra asked uh, Lakshmi Kannan about her creative act or creative struggle or impulse. What she says is actually very eye opener. She says, there is a luminous something that glimmers and beckons from a distance. See, there is a luminous something that glimmers and beckons from a distance. Still in an ascent state, it threatens to dissolve any moment to merge in the fleeting, I mean any, any uh, creative work say for that matter poetry or uh, novel or whatsoever, any creative art is not only a creative art only because it is full of emotions, rather emotions are have actually to be merge in the fleeting amorphous life around it. Whatever we see around ourselves, whatever happens around ourselves, if that actually affects and it actually merges with the feelings. It is a point that excites a story to take shape within a crucible of consciousness.
consciousness that is actually the main thing fine consciousness that is anxious to capture this something in its true lights in mid flight as it were when that begins with that begins the lonely uncertain search of a writer when she decides on how much to tell and how much to hold back or how much to hide my dear friends poetry is actually the voice of the unsaid feelings attack us affect us and we actually try to recreate those feelings in the form of poetry it actually keeps on simmering glimmering burning and finally it takes shapes tossing as she does on the dialectics of a wish to assert herself as a writer running counter to a more luxurious wish to simply surrender to her subject in silence so what uh, kanan sage is uh, very important and and it actually weighs a lot of meaning that whenever an artist surrenders i think the real art cannot come out so what the what the writer or the poet does is in order to assert himself or herself as a writer running counter to more luxurious wish to simply surrender to her subject in silence so the writer has uh, several responsibilities the poet has several responsibilities uh, before him or her now as i have been saying uh, that lakshmi kannan is a poet who believes in several traditions but at the same time she actually tries to oppose those traditions and here when she opposes what is at the back of her mind is the marginality of women and in this regard there is one poem which actually deserves mention and the poem is titled don't was actually you might be reminded of kamla das where she says no fit in no she, she uses the word fit in be kamala madhavi or say madhavi kutti and here what lakshmi kannan says she actually reminds us of because uh, in the poem she has uh, dedicated this poem to and and she says for rasa sundari devi majority of us are familiar with this name rasa sundari devi who was actually the first indian woman especially first indian women a bengali writer who actually wrote her autobiography entitled amar jibon fine in 1876 now see how the poet goes back and now she says but she has actually a point to prove and while proving that point what she says is really worth mentioning don't ever clean with water the dark sooty walls look at the lines don't ever clean with water the dark sooty walls of your kitchen rasa sundari now here she is addressing rasa sundari and she says she actually talks of domesticity and then she in a way reflects the life of a woman who is confined to the kitchen but then that does not mean she has also confined her own choice her own yearning her own imagination her own choices her own yearning to move forward and that is why she said don't ever clean with water the dark sooty walls so the darkness also refers to the darkness in which the women are sooty walls of your kitchen rasa sundari for the akshara you scratched akshara you scratched women have got you know in those days women were not given the freedom to go to the school and learn and that was a sort of traditional you know etiquette or a traditional mode uh, but then what uh, she says what the poet here says the akshara that a woman writes on the sooty dark wall so this reflects a sort of imagination this reflects a sort of wish this reflects a sort of desire desire for what desire for knowledge because it is this knowledge only that can uh, pull you out of the darkness out of that dark world the dark world of kitchen so for the akshara you scratched on the walls so furtively 
very secretly did you write on the wall some of the words, some of the letters, the akshara you tried to match with the sounds you heard. Now a woman, you know, my dear friends, the world is beautiful only because of women, because all of us are born of women. And the sort of education that we get from our mothers and from our grandmothers, and we get uh, those uh, educational relations uh, through stories, through narrations and whatsoever. And here uh, the poet says, the akshara, the word that you tried to match, because you are only meant to listen. Other people might be reading. Adult, other people might be studying and you simply heard those sounds and you tried to itch those sounds on the dark sooty walls. They have quickened now with life. So the sounds that you have heard, the sounds that you have heard, those sounds which you are trying to scratch on these uh, uh, walls, what they have done now, they have quickened now with life. With the passage of time, they have quickened now. Even as you wash rice, fish, vegetables, even as you peel, cut, bake, stir and cook. These were the fort. These were actually the everyday uh, duties, activities of a woman. And then she says, the thieving letters on the wall, whatever you wrote secretly, silently, fine, on the walls will take wings. One day all these uh, sounds which are getting the form of letters through your, through your pitite fingers, one day they will take wings, they will actually help you. Because this is how, you know, you have a desire to learn, but you have not been provided with the facilities, but she says, oh Rasa Sundari Devi, don't ever clean with water. So Rasa Sundari Devi symbolizes women of all sorts, women of all kinds. They fly down to the palm leaf you once stole from your son. No. The desire for learning, no. Because men were only meant to study. And even if the son be, so uh, the poet says, they fly down to the palm leaf you once stole from your son. See how the letters move. You can have a look how these letters move in the eyes of the mind. The sound that you heard, these sounds are not meaningless. The sound were not sound and fury. But these sounds signified everything and they are now taking shapes in the eyes of the mind. Then leap over back to the wall from the pages of Chaitanya Bhagavata you tore from the book. You, your desire was not only to learn the everyday things, but you also tried to learn, you know, the religious, the scriptures, uh, the messages of the scriptures and the lines that you heard, you know, the lines from the Chaitanya Bhagavata which you tore from the book because you are not allowed to when no one was looking. So, you had so many restrictions, but now those restrictions uh, through which you have got a sort of, you know, courage to write some of the uh, words on the walls, those uh, words have now taken shape, they are now becoming language. You no, need no book, Rasa Shundri, no paper or pen either, you have the black smudgy kitchen wall. There is a reference to slates. In olden days, people used to write on slates. And, and what the poet here is suggesting is that you do not need any paper, you have the kitchen wall which can act, no? It's very metaphoric, my dear friend, which can act as a sort of slate where you can black smudgy kitchen wall for your magical scribbles, lines, ellipses, curves, all of them, your secret codes for a whole new world. And these only can be a secret code for the new world that you are actually trying to enter into. Meaning thereby, there is actually a sort of advocacy for education. 
So through this poem, Don't Was, we come to see not only the pitiable condition of women in those days, but even after that, even in post-independent India, a woman is talking about and simply saying, Oh, Rasa Shundari Devi, please don't wash, don't clean those walls which are smudgy, which are dark, but then they act because you have written some of the words there. We can take uh, uh, some other poems also and uh, in other poems also one can find a sort of craving desire, a craving desire, a sort of uh, crave, uh, a sort of craving for the choice, a sort of craving for individuality. The poem is titled C. She wears well tailored clothes and value judgments with flair, filling them out with her form that houses a being tight and spring tensed. Look at the lines. She wears well tailored clothes and value judgments with flair, filling them out with her form that houses a being tight and spring tensed. She is house proud. She is a housemaker. And, and in under brackets he says, as she needs to be, she should be proud of the house. Her dining room simply gleams with clean health, cheerful carnations on the table, bursting with colors, tempered with the white of ladies lace, sitting and leaving rooms, breathing an air of uncluttered ease, the floor swept clean as her empty heart. So, there is a sort of parallelism, there is a sort of analogy, uh, what the women dodge every day, uh, but then despite cleaning everything, despite sweeping the floor, despite maintaining the entire house, her real house is empty, her real heart is empty, the floor swept clean as her empty heart. Through the open doors, she stares across. So, in a world of confinement, she only can find a passage. She only can find the doors, the doors to freedom. Fine? And she only looks at the sky. So, looking at the sky symbolizes a lot of things. An urge for freedom, an urge for spread, an urge actually for broadening her horizon, orderly back garden, tracing her lengthening shadow, she can only look back, lengthening shadow with the uh, flux of time. Uh, her shadows are simply lengthening on long afternoons of peeling stillness. Outside the mango tree has blossomed biennially like a rare poet. So, even the tree, no, even outside the tree which stands, the tree has also grown. The young mango tree has blossomed by annually. There has been a fruition, there has been a flowering, and, 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 and you know, but what about the life of a woman? Like a rare poet, a rash of new glossy leaves, seeming copper, and on the branches, sweet throated birds evoked the pain of memories like the sweet throated birds. So, there is a sort of envy, a sort of jealousy, like the jealousy that Keats in one of his poems says, no, to the nightingale you remember, no, with a full throated ease you can sing, but I cannot because I am a human being and here the condition is that of a woman and the woman actually has an uh, envy with a bird and what she finds? Sweet throated birds evoked. So, there is also a, a metaphorical expression here that even though women they speak very sweetly, they have a very sweet voice which the society has time and again asked of them to be, but then what is there? The pain of memories, the pain of memories. She looked at the eagle soaring above in circles, shrill not tearing through the cool blue. She cried silently with a kite as it glanced down, eyes frankly red and angry. So, look at these lines which are so pregnant with meaning. She looked at the eagle, so freedom, soaring above in circles, shrill not tearing through the cool blue. She cried silently. At least, no, these uh, eagles, they are in groups. 
But here C cried silently with the kite. She looks at the kite which is flying. So the kite symbolizes so many things. Ambition, freedom, flying high, soaring as it glanced down. But as the kite glanced down, eyes frankly red and angry. The coming down of the kite symbolizes the coming of a sort of despair, a sort of dis distress, a sort of disappointment, a sort of dejection, a sort of debasement, a sort of derailment which the women does not deserve. So, through one poem and the other, we can find uh, that Lakshmi Kannan has very beautifully characterized her poetic world, even though. Uh, uh, on majority of occasions we find that her tone is very narrative because every now and then it is it has been written in the first person narrative. Of course, the expression is very economical, but the language is very figurative. In this regard, when we compare uh, D'Souza and uh, um, Lakshmi Kannan, Kannan was more subtle and the language became very figurative. The setting as we find majority of the poems have Indian setting, the Indian kitchen, no, the Indian sky, fine. There is a regional flavor also if we uh, come across some other poems and in many of the poems like if we take some of the poems from Unquiet Waters, there is actually a nature imagery and symbol, fine. So, when she says unquiet waters, what she means? Water and woman have been fused into one. Uh, they are actually flowing uh, quietly, but are they really quiet? They are unquiet, fine. There is a chaos within, fine. The style is free. So, the free style and the lucid style is also another weapon to carry forward because the poet is, poetess is actually yearning for a freedom. Freedom not for herself, freedom not for the individual self, but freedom for the women of her own uh, community, the women of her own ilk, the women in general. There is another poem named uh, Doubt where we can find that even though when she depicts love, she is quite doubtful and what she says is, you insisted it was me, in the verse of your love I gaze in consternation. So, all sorts of flatteries that you men are making, always singing of the glories of love, but then in the verse of your love I gaze in consternation at you too, at you too. At you too, I am quite doubtful, no? That you should feel the lines of your own love potential. Have you ever examined? Have you ever thought of? Have you ever introspected whether this love is a sort of pure love? While uh, she, she says all this, this may also be a question to oneself when we think of our own individuality. Are we really true to ourselves as well? But then the poet says, at you too, that you should feel the lines of your own love potential and trace a woman there, I, I doubt, is not it? So, there is actually a question that even in the course of love, you know, when you make all sorts of, you know, all sorts of swearing, swooning and what not, but is the verse of love really being colored? with the true sensations of love, that is what as a woman I often doubt, I trace a woman uh, there. So, the love is not a uh, love and, and we remember when you know Shakespeare says, love is not love when it alteration finds, though rosy licks and chicks within its bending sickles compass come. No? I mean time you know, if, if people only hanker after uh, the beautiful things and they actually make several swearings in the name of love, is that love really the love? Because that is actually love for the body, not for the beauty of the heart. We have already been saying that uh, Kannan's world is also full of imagery and symbol. Kannan uses uh, natural imagery like uh, birds, winds, rain, storms, shadow, curds and mango trees. 
So if you read Unquiet Waters, even though it is about water, but it is about uh, uh, life because water symbolizes birth, water symbolizes creativity, water symbolizes continuity, water symbolizes creation and recreation, water symbolizes a sort of fluidity, water symbolizes a sort of flexibility, water symbolizes a new generation that is in store. So what the poet says? Uh, in, in while uh, depicting a sort of uh, natural imagery. The birds have flown home, the people retired for the day, sounds have still, but the uncertain lights wait, they wait. So there is a loneliness also and this loneliness uh, gets a sort of analogy with the loneliness of someone who has been left, who have been abandoned in love, who have been cheated. Uh, there are symbols of rain as I said. Uh, and all these uh, symbolize fertility, rainfall and birth because uh, Kannan is a poet and Kannan is a poet with commitment and there is a commitment uh, not only for natural objects but there is commitment towards life. Uh, one can also find uh, references uh, to uh, the uh, journey of Diya in a river which is actually symbolical of the continuity of life and then water which can both create and which can both erase water has that potential, water has that ability. So women are like water, they can give birth, they can provide sustenance but at the same time when there is enough of water, there can be destruction as well. Uh, while depicting her own women, fine, especially in unquiet waters as I have been saying, she actually presents a different and a distinct picture of women where she says that they are not only flowers, but they are actually the springs of life which actually nurture the flowers. So women have got immense potentiality, they not only nurture life, they actually bring the spring down to earth. Actually Kannan equates the flow of river to the flow of a woman's sentiments and feelings, fine. Uh, they come every day to river to take bath to celebrate, to worship and to ultimately everything returns to water. Water has a sort of, not only a sort of religious because every now and then you ride from our birth to our death, water has its prominent role to play. So water is the source of creation of everything, cycle of birth, death and rebirth and women have all these qualities and that is why they have created this beautiful world. They nourish, they cherish and ultimately they in turn create a beautiful world. Uh, in, in several of her poems she has uh, made uh, references uh, not from Indian scriptures but also from uh, biblical stories and all. So while she talks about uh, Draupadi in one of her poems and she mentions the myth of Draupadi and then also uh, Guinevere. Uh, Guinevere was actually, Guinevere comes from the Arthurian legend uh, where uh, Guinevere is, was uh, the wife of King Arthur and Guinevere was very powerful but Guinevere was also infamous for her love of uh, Lancelot. She provided this sort of opening and it is only because of that that the kingdom was ruined and it is, it is said that later on uh, 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 Guinevere actually survived her husband's uh, death and then she repented her sins and actually became a nun. So while uh, she uh, refers to uh, the Draupadi myth and Guinevere myth, uh, so some of the lines which are uh, very important and which are worth mentioning are, she has done it, has offended the supreme male. So when she says the supreme male, there is a dig on it, has offended the supreme male into a sullen silence by her terrible nakedness by her terrible nakedness. So while we explain themes one after another, uh, we must realize uh, that Lakshmi Kannan not only uh, makes a mention of ordinary women uh, while uh, uh, she says uh, in, in one of uh, the poems, no, no, do not run, do not take long strides. Now where she talks of all these negatives, she actually is taking a dig on this patriarchal order, on this androcentric world. No, no, do not run, fine. So the po poems like Family Tree and Woodrose, she actually criticizes 
the patriarchal framework and says, says, no, no, don't run, don't take long strides, don't raise your voice, be a woman, be moderate in everything, be a model of mediocrity. So, this is actually a slap on the face of this patriarchal order because these are, are some of the restrictions, these are some of the commandments which are being made by uh, this uh, <clears throat> male sovereignistic society. But then uh, she does not confine only herself to uh, the domesticity of ordinary women, rather she also talks about uh, devotion as we have said ek danta visharjana, fine and, and there uh, she thanks Lord Ganesha for Ganesha, Lord Ganesha has always been with her and she says, you were there in the images they called lovely, in the lines they found powerful, in the ellipses that were limbed in light, you made them so. Oh Ganesha, you have always been with me uh, in all sorts of conditions and circumstances, but then you made them so, I do not know, but I do carry you everywhere with me. So, this actually gives a sort of indication and attestation of the fact that despite uh, struggling for the rights of women and despite sympathizing with the plight of women, uh, Alakshmi Kannan also was quite devotional and she devoted herself submissively to the Lord Ganesha. So, in a way she was traditional, but there was a sort of spiritual yearning in some of her poems. Actually, majority of uh, Lakshmi Kannan's poems have got Indian settings where one can uh, get a beautiful panorama of Indian life, a picturesque quality of uh, the description of uh, rituals, myth and life. She also talks about ordinary Indian people uh, and uh, her language uh, which are her mother tongue that is Tamil. So, Tamil language and culture finds a special mention in some of her works where she says, sitting on a clean swept earth fed us on cooked rice, laced with the salt of folk tales, fed us on curds and kamban as we licked the tang of Tamil. So, this also reminds us of some other women poets, though diasporic Sujata Bhatt, where she brings uh, her own uh, language in the midst of English. But here she was bilingual and uh, that is how she practiced her own art. Actually Lakshmi Kannan should deserve, uh, Lakshmi Kannan deserves the attention that she has not been paid to and it is time uh, that you as curious readers and listeners and poetry lovers gave more and more attention to Lakshmi Kannan. It is in this regard Srinivas Iyengar's comments to be taken very seriously where he says, she feels I mean Lakshmi Kannan, she feels that poetry in English by Indian women oscillates between writing as a social manifestation, writing as a social manifestation or assertiveness and the desire to accomplish a literary competence. So, this is actually what Srinivas Iyengar, uh, the doyen of Indian writing in English uh, uh, comments about um, Lakshmi Kannan and uh, it, is, it is a sort of realization that Kannan feels that poetry by Indian English women poets, they are actually oscillating between the two, oscillating between, between writing as a social manifestation and then assertiveness and a desire to accomplish a literary competence. My dear friends, uh, we could have gone on and on and could have discussed as much could have been possible, but then at my back as I have always been saying, at my back I always hear times winged chariot hurrying near and the time is now sharp and it is now wise to wind up my lecture wishing you all a good day uh, and promising you to meet in the next talk once again. Thank you very much. Have a nice day.